Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining um, for our second lecture uh, of the semester. Today, we're uh, really pleased to welcome uh, Felix Heisel, who's an architect and uh, an academic who works uh, towards the systematic redesign of the built environment as a material depot of endless use and reconfiguration. Uh, Felix is an assistant professor at Cornell uh, University, um, and he runs the Circular Construction Lab. Uh, so we're going to be hearing all about kind of a new redefinition of sustainability through, uh, through basically circular material economies. And so we're going to be hearing a lot about that. Um, I think when it comes to the theme of, um, of the lecture series this year, um, you know, really couldn't have a better candidate um, for someone to come and talk to us about, about this redefinition of practice and this redefinition of our relationship to materials. Um, also, you know, sort of really kind of redefining what it means for architecture to be significant um, relative to its permanence. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. And uh, Felix, I'll let you kind of uh, take it from here. But thank you so much for coming. Oh, put this on. For the... <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Brooke, Jonathan, for the introduction. Everyone in the background making this possible. Thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for bringing me here, and thank you for attending this um, uh, lecture today. Um, I think the lecture series has a super interesting prompt um, and a super relevant prompt. Um, and so I want to congratulate you on putting this together. Um, and my approach to, to answering some of the questions that were faced in this prompt is sort of kind of cross-disciplinary and cross-scalar. Um, and so I want to show a couple of strategies that that relate to that from our work. And if I say our work, that means the Circular Construction Lab at Cornell University, but it also means my office, which is uh, based in Germany. Um, and so the projects that I'm gonna show are kind of a mirage of these different entities, different authors, and I'm the one talking about it, but I wanna acknowledge everyone else who's, who's been part of, the, of these projects um, to, to bring them to a presentable stage. <laughs> um, and this is not moving along. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, circular construction lab. Our um, our focus is really kind of looking at the built environment in two directions. The one direction is looking towards the past, looking at all the buildings, all the materials that have been already used, that have been built already, um, and trying to understand how we can use those as a resource for a future building, right? And that has to do with techniques, methods, just simply understanding what is in these buildings. We have no idea what our built environment is made up out of. Um, so that's the one perspective. And the other perspective is looking towards the future, figuring out, so what now? How can we build differently so that we don't run into the same problems that we face right now? in 50, 70, 500 years down the road when the buildings that we're building right now um, come to the end of their service time. Um, and so this is the current team, um, mostly um, undergrad and grad students, uh, Cornell, um, Spring Group, and some PhD students and, and visiting scholars. Um, we're a growing, uh, growing group. Um, we started two and a half years ago and it's been a fantastic ride um, so far. Um, when, I, when I start these presentations, I always start with a slide because I think it's super important to kind of zoom out and now we're zooming out very far, right? This is uh, um, the so-called Milankovitch cycles, which are representing the relationship between the sun and planet Earth um, in kind of three categories, the eccentricity, the obliquity, and the precession. Um, and the details aren't so important as um, maybe the, the time scale, right? We're talking 200,000 years or 40,000 years per cycle. Um, and if you overlay these three sinus curves, you're getting um, um, an, an overlay, right? Um, and peaks, and we can see those by looking a closer look at, at ice cores um, from these kind of drilling sites. 
this one an example from Antarctica, where we can go, you know, thousands of ten thousands of years into the past. Um, and so this is just one excerpt from from these scans, which goes now here eight hundred thousand years into the past, and you can see the the top. Um, the green line are these Milankovitch cycles. And we can see whenever there's a peak, um, it represents, for example, an ice age in, in the climate on, on planet Earth. And the reason why I'm showing this is because we can now, from that, reconstruct the so-called geological time scale, right? And, and so um, this is a bit blurry, but at the very top here, we suddenly have something pushed in which, you know, the, the line is actually just super thin, right? It's just the last 70 years um, compared to, you know, 4.5 billion years. Um, and, and something changed here because if you look at another set of graphs, right? Human influence suddenly overtook the importance of this planetary scale. So for the first time in 800,000 years, these measures here are more important than this relationship of planet and earth, uh, planet earth and sun, excuse me. Um, and it doesn't really matter what graph you look at here, like population growth, GDP growth, but it could also be uh, shrimp aquaculture or acidification or transportation. These are all eerily similar, right? They pick up somewhere in the 1950s. And some of them are exponential, still growing. Some of them are slowing down, but they all have a kind of commonality to them. Um, and that is the reason why we're now talking about the Anthropocene or at least a geological time that is influenced by humans. It could also be a Capitalocene, right? The, the debate is still open. What is, what is the real cause of this? Humans have been here longer than 70 years, right? So maybe it's not just us, but it is the way we behave right now that massively changes the, the way the planet is behaving. And why am I saying this here as an, as an architecture school? Architecture and the built environment is one of the key drivers of this, right? So if you take the, um, uh, the life of a building from the beginning to the end, 50% of the materials that we take out of the Earth's crust go into the built environment. 40% of solid waste that's being produced comes from the built environment. And as we all know now, um, roughly 39% of carbon emissions come from the built environment. I'm assuming it's actually more. Um, and so it's worth looking at these carbon emissions a little bit more in detail. Again, you see the exact same curve as these other indicators going somewhere in the 1950s. It starts growing exponentially. Fortunately, it slowed down a little bit. Um, but what we would need to do um, to reach the Paris Climate Goal Agreement of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is actually to mirror this graph, right? So we need to rapidly and very rapidly reduce carbon emissions actually in the next eight years by 65% to have a chance to meet these goals. And this is a tremendous undertaking considering the size, the scale, and the amount of stakeholders that are working in this industry, right, this global industry. Um, and so if you zoom into these 39% a little more, then you know that 28% come from building operation and 11 from the production of materials and the putting together of houses, right, the construction. Um, but it's not as easy as this, because if you take in account the time scale that we're now facing, right? It's this eight years to reduce 65%, then it's super important to change these numbers because if you build a building today, right? Then you might, after let's say 30, 35 years, operational carbon emissions and embodied carbon emissions might be roughly 50-50 in relationship. But if we only look at the next 10 or eight years, then embodied carbon emissions are 74% or more of that percentage because operational carbon emissions are emitted year by year by year, little by little by little, versus embodied carbon emissions are emitted on day one when I move into the building, right? And so if we want to make quick change, we need to change the way we built. That's the, the kind of the main message from, from this, right? 
And so if you look at materials, um, the, the, the material with the least amount of carbon emissions is the one that's already there, right? The one that we don't have to produce anymore. And so if we look at reclaimed materials, that is, that's one way, but a very promising way to make quick change, right? Um, and so within the shift from a linear economy to a circular economy, right? Um, if you zoom in a little bit more into these cycles, um, the, the thickest lines, right, are the ones that talk about direct reuse, the local, the local scale, the smaller the cycle, the better in a, in a circular economy understanding, right? We can do recycling, but the impact of that is essentially a prolongation of a linear system. The closer you get towards a direct reuse and the closer you get to the place the building is already, like local reuse, the better in terms of um, the circular economy. And when we look at what is a circular economy, we in the lab work off the definition from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that was published in 2015. Um, that says the circular economy is one that is restorative and regenerative by design um, that keeps products, components, and materials um, at their highest utility and value at all times, um, and that distinguishes between technical and biological cycles. And the keyword, which actually isn't both in this uh, on this slide, for me is by design, right? because this is a call to action for all of us here in the room, right? This is our domain, right? We can go in and say, okay, we design waste out. We can, can go to the beginning of the cycle and change the way we operate so that at the end of the cycle, we're not producing waste. Right? Unfortunately, this is still the status quo, right? So this is a picture two, three months old in Ithaca. This is hailed as, you know, circular economy. This is recycling. We're grinding down the concrete. We're sorting out the steel. I've, after a little bit of questions with the foreman on the side, we figured out the steel actually is shipped to China to re be recycled there. We're not talking local. We're not talking reuse. We're, we're you know, this is the, the status quo of our, of our industry. Um, and if you go in a little bit more and keep in mind that the definition is highest utility and value, none of these operations fulfill this, right? We are downcycling materials um, from concrete to aggregate, but we're needing new cements to build new buildings. So all of the emission problem in recycled concrete is still there. Um, with glass recycling, for example, we can, we're downcycling all of our building glass because the contamination issue here, if you look at this, this is a kind of you know, collection of flat glass, um, float glass panels. If you have one gram of uh, sand in a ton of flat glass, you can't make new float glass out of it. So the way we operate a construction site, we have definitely more than one gram of sand or dust in this pile, right? And so this will never turn into float glass again. Or if we use an excavator to demolish a building, where the moment we start attacking the building and break pieces, we're losing the value and utility of these pieces. So we need to talk about new processes on how to ex kind of how to address and, and harvest these materials. And we need to talk about new material systems and new strategies for designing with these materials. Um, and essentially to sum this introduction up, right, this is where we are today. Um, sort of, we are starting to reduce the amount of materials coming from mining processes. Uh, we're still putting a lot of materials into the landfill um, and reusing recycling and demolition as the kind of dominant processes. And if we really wanted to shift from that to a circular construction or circular economy, um, then we would consider deconstruction reuse um, as, as the dominant factors. We would include kind of materials that are coming from landfill mining. So it's coming back into the environment from um, sources that we've already assumed are lost, right? And we're regenerating the environment by bringing things back into, into the, to the earth, into the ground. 
Um, and I want to show some examples of, of how this can look like. Um, this is a really old example that I pulled out again um, to show today, um, a pavilion that we built in 2014 in, in New York. Um, and it started with this material, which is um, a clear downcycling process, right? It's, we're, we're talking tetra pack wastes, tetra packs or, or any drinking cartons um, are scrambled up um, and usually landfilled in the US. Um, because of that combination of three materials that are you know, laminated together and we don't have the technology here as for example in Finland to separate these materials and bring them into separate um, source separated uh, cycles um, and so um, what this company um, does is essentially create an alternative to a gypsum board from these scraps by just applying heat and pressure um, and so we use that material to build a, a pavilion that essentially used a kind of flat pack system. So these materials were uh, CNC cut out of these panels, assembled only using straps into bricks. And then those bricks were assembled into a vault, um, compression only vault um, that then uh, sat on these also only strapped together panels um, to, to give them a kind of a little bit of, of height, right? And the beauty of it was that you could still read the original resource. So um, the orange vault was um, orange juice. Um, the blue ones were milk cartons. If you look the other way, it was black because it was a, a kind of um, wine uh, drinking cartons. Um, but you can also see the kind of um, engineering of this design for disassembly where at the end of the, um, the the pavilion timeline we only cut those straps and the whole pavilion turned into these kind of flat sheets again which then went back to the uh, manufacturer who scrambled them up again and made new sheets out of them and so this pavilion now is in someone's bathroom kind of providing the the cladding for um, or the, the substructure for tiles for example um, and of course those uh, went back and, and it were reused again. Um, a bit bigger in scale and much more multi-material was a project um, that we built in Germany for the Federal Garden Show um, uh, in 2019, which is the Mehrwert Pavillon. Um, and that pavilion uh, essentially consists of four different material families. Um, the, the shell is built out of glass, uh, the structure out of steel, all the furniture is out of plastics, and then all the kind of foundation and, and flooring is from mineral demolition waste. Um, and with these material families came different strategies of how to address um, the resource and the design. Um, and so some of the strategies in the flooring um, are very, we're very used to those, right? Of course, we can reuse um, stones and make new paving out of this, right? Um, but uh, the white here is uh, ceramic waste that was destined for landfill. And for us, the question was, how can we grind it down in, in just the exact size of particles and mixture of these uh, particles to get a water bound surface that is wheelchair accessible. Um, and so we had 1.5 million um, visitors walk through this, uh, this kind of um, snowy landscape essentially. Uh, which had this beautiful sparkling effects um, of, of this kind of crystals. Um, and in the end, we could just lift it up, right? Because there was no adhesive and it. it was just the right um, mixture of, of particle sizes. Um, the, the facade is made out of uh, different uh, glass resources, mostly in this case, uh, bottle glass, container glass um, that is melted into a product uh, it's a sintering process, but the sintering process heats it just enough to make a homogeneous material out of it, but not enough to basically um, heat it completely. And so you see all these shards from the broken glass, uh, which means you need less energy, but it also means that you have an aesthetic that you could not create from a virgin resource, right? And so there is an added value in this, in this process. Um, but most interesting for me is the kind of question, how do we address the structure? Because here we said we can't re just use recycling steel. Every steel today is recycled, right? We're, we're already that far that most steel that you buy today is 98, 95% re recycling content. 
Um, and all of it involves reheating the material at immense energy inputs. Um, and so how can we build something that out of directly reused steel is a very different question and a very different complexity. Um, and so we found um, this kind of conundrum of, of the energy um, debate where Germany right now is shutting down its coal-fired power plants, which leaves the country with enormous infrastructure buildings where we have no idea what to do with them. Right? So this is a coal-fired power plant that was shut down in 2019 um, and uh, looked like this just a couple of months later right? because no one knew what to do with that. No one was able to rebuild it. So it just blew up the whole thing. And we had the chance to just before that happened, go in and basically pick a couple of steel members, like going in the forest, say, I want that tree and want that tree. Um, the problem with this was that we now had a resource, but we had no idea what kind of steel that is. Right? There was no documentation, there's no information. Um, and so it resulted in the fact that we were um, testing a large amount of samples of the steel in five different ways, uh, notch testing, chemical analysis, weldability, uh, tensile tests and compression tests um, to in the end find out, oh, this is standard structural steel. But with that result in hand, we were then able to just apply for a building permit as we would have had applied for a building permit with a normal, um, uh, in the normal process. Um, the other thing, and I think that's more important is that of course, designing with a resource like this, where you have X amount of members of this size, and X amount of members of this diameter results in a different formal language. And this is where it gets really exciting where the resource influences and informs uh, the, the design process. And so this is the structure of these four trees, like tree branching structures. Um, it's not a tree, uh, structurally at least, uh, these branching um, structures um, that, that hold this, uh, this facade up. And that's how it looked at night. Um, interesting fact is that this was liked so much um, that after the um, installation ended, we were able to move the whole building because it was designed for disassembly from its location in that park to the city center of Heilbronn, where it is now a kind of public um, element. And so the, the fact that we designed it for this assembly actually allowed for another use cycle of the building afterwards. Um, and so the question then comes, how does this scale? Right? Because now we've looked at little pavilions. Um, and that's a super interesting, super complicated question, because if you look at this is an image of the um, building stock in, in Ithaca, where Cornell is uh, located. Um, first of all, we don't know anything about these buildings. They were all built in 1910, but we don't know how much material is in there, what's actually in the wall. Most of them are surprisingly uninsulated. There's nothing in the wall, but you know, you only find out if you go in and actually make a hole in it, because it's the only way to find out. Um, and so for us, the first question was, how can we figure out a way to do this quicker and to get an idea of what the value of a house is for the design process, also to kind of close the gap between demand and supply, but be able to design with these resources earlier before you start demolishing or deconstructing a house. And so we're working in the lab on a um tool that's called we call it scanner um which is scan for reuse and it's kind of combining um qualitative and quantitative questionnaires with um lidar scanning um to then auto generate these meshes which then um through an algorithm and the connection to a data set of archetype structures generates information about how much timber how much um which dimensions of timber, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are probably in that building. Of course, it is an assumption. Of course, there's a ballpark figure, but it gives a first indication and a very quick one because you need about two hours to do a scan like this um, to the building owner, to the city of what the value of this resource is right? before to then inform a conversation. Should we deconstruct this house or should we just demolish it? And, and there, there is suddenly, a value that can be attached to this other than it needs to go because we need to build something new. And 
Um, and so this is the kind of reports that this uh, generates about you know how much surface area, how much carbon is in these buildings, um, together with some assumptions about you know how do you actually make it tangible, right? These um, these embodied carbon numbers are so abstract that we usually don't know what it means. Um, so one of these houses is the same as 80 acres of forest sequestration in one year right? to just give you an idea of, of what what the value of such a house actually is in terms of environmental impact. Um, and so the interesting thing about this specific um, area is that we then had the chance to um, the unfortunate chance um, to do a comparison between demolition and deconstruction right there because uh, in January of this year um a developer went in and dem uh, demolished that whole street so 11 houses um were taken down to to design new student housing um and we convinced the developer to deconstruct one of these 11 and so now we have a data set of 10 houses that were demolished and one that was deconstructed of the same time of the same in the same conditions and it starts being a really interesting data set to work with um so this was uh, the demolition and you can see in the background, you have the excavator that works through these houses and in the foreground, us trying to stay within the timeline of the, of the, um, uh, the developer, because his only condition was, yes, you can do this, but if the excavator catches up on you, the excavator takes over because time is money, right? So we had essentially a week to deconstruct a three-story house for 4,500 square foot. And so it was clear from the beginning, this doesn't work the traditional deconstruction way. We cannot carry out beam by beam and match that timeline. Um, and so what we decided on is a, um, a technique that's called panelized deconstruction that essentially goes in and cuts these pieces out of the building. So whole panels of the roof, the whole gable wall, the whole floor, floors, slabs were being lifted out cut to the size of a, of a trailer and then moved off site and then being processed at a different location and that it allowed us to be out of the site in four and a half days um, and hand this over to the, the uh, developer to um, to then continue the normal construction process and we were able to with that salvage um, a quite a good amount of, of materials. Um, which means this is kind of the end of this five days right you have the whole house stacked up in panels um, at, uh, at the local reuse center which we partnered with in this in this endeavor um, but the interest of the lab of course in these kind of works is is not only on the material level but kind of understanding what is the what is the potential of these techniques and all these materials and so one of them is of course we know uh, what kind of contaminants are in these buildings of course all of this was painted by with lead paint as it was common in these times right and so so you, you start generating other data sets um, attached to it we we of course now know what was salvaged right the amount of um, simply board foot uh, of material that was integrated back into the into the market um we are starting to get an idea of which materials in this process you can salvage and which ones you can't um uh, th there's uh some of these are very site specific for example in new york where we don't have a asphalt recycling system simply not allowed other states very happily and very successfully recycle asphalt so this is a, a ju jurisdiction problem as well um, some others are, are more a problem of how do you approach this, right? And what do you do with a concrete foundation? I think is a, yet a whole other, other topic, but we were very successful on, on that side. Um, and so you start recreating these materials you, and reintegrating um, these materials into, into the market. Um, but you also create, for example, an immense public knowledge and a a volunteer labor force that was out there helping us so we had more than 50 volunteers that helped um, salvage the other 10 houses so everything right before the excavator came whatever it was able to pull out of these houses was done with, with volunteer labor um, all the way up to the acting mayor who, who stood there in the bitter cold carrying out flooring boards and so that creates a, a, a new um new atmosphere and a new conversation in the town 
which we're now um, very successfully uh, addressing in terms of like how can we how can we change the policy based on these uh, numbers. Um, deconstruction also is a incredible tool to create a local green labor force, um, and it comes from the fact that deconstruction takes six times as much labor as demolition right for, for to demolish a house you need an excavator and two people in two days something like that to deconstruct one you're somewhere at six, a, a working crew of six skilled carpenters um, and it take two or three weeks um, but but while this is an economic question right who pays for this it is an incredibly important aspect in terms of why would a city move towards deconstruction what is the benefit for society and so these these uh, um, uh, questions are now becoming really interesting on that political uh, agenda um, we use this to uh, as a workforce development um, platform so we had the local labor union bring their apprentices into this project and actually teach them on deconstruction while taking this this building down uh, we had local uh, carpenters and uh, kind of do skill building programs on on how to deconstruct houses. Um, and I'm now increasingly including it into the educational um, side as well. So just this are pictures from just uh, two weeks ago where we had a deconstruction workshop on a different building um, with students from my seminar and design studio taking out a, down a house partially um, in, in a couple of days, but it's a super important lesson to, to know how do I get something apart that wasn't meant to be taken apart, right? And, and for everyone that's tried that, when going back to the drawing board, the detail looks different because you now know how difficult it is to take something apart. And maybe you can design for disassembly in, in the next step. Um, and so this is us uh, denailing these flooring boards, uh, which is actually a super fun activity. I love denailing; it's so satisfying to get these nails out again, right? Um, and so this is this is something um, that we're now including into into the uh, the studio environment. Um, but of course, always combined with how do we understand this resource? How do we document this resource? What kind of databases can we build up using these resources? Um, I mentioned the political dimension of this um, in 2020, end of 20, um, 2020, we started a stakeholder network, uh, which is called Crowd, uh, short for Circularity, Reuse and Zero Waste Development, which is now advising uh, local governments and municipalities on policy changes in New York State. Our recent, uh, most recent member that joined us is PACNI, which is the Preservation Association of Central New York. So we're growing uh, in, in, in reach and also in importance, which uh, is, is super satisfying. Um, and we're now working together with the uh, city of Ithaca, but also the city of Troy um, and some other local municipalities to, um, to, to change the policy. And the first thing we did was simply bringing out a, a report on a, and a resource guide on who could do such work, where are people that are skilled enough to, to do um, deconstruction, um, what does it take, uh, how much waste do we generate. The lab also um, prepared a template for a, a request for proposals. If you wanted to deconstruct a house, how would you go about it? So this is free um, as a template. Um, available on our website um, and the, the last step now is that we're writing a sample uh, template ordinance for the city of Ithaca uh, for a deconstruction ordinance that would then forbid demolition and only allow deconstruction um, as the method to to scale this right on a, on a political level um, and that brings me to kind of the question what does that mean right if we now suddenly have X amount of buildings being deconstructed, you need the capacity to do this locally. Um, we learned from Milwaukee that it's not as easy. Um, that's kind of the prominent example where an ordinance from Portland was imported and applied without first building up the capacity and it backfired badly um, because you suddenly had all these super expensive processes that created material stacks that no one was able to work with, right? And, and now, 
we're back to land. Um, and so in this process, we're now working with the city of Ithaca to build a digital twin of the whole city um, using kind of lighter point clouds, our data set of uh, construction archetypes um, and, uh, and a lot of uh, modeling software because we're looking at this from a holistic standpoint of modeling both embodied and operational carbon emissions for the whole 6, 000, uh, set of 6,000 buildings in the city. Um, and the goal is, uh, I mean, this is a couple of process pictures. How do you get from a really bad point cloud to a kind of volume that then allows us to do these simulations and in combination with the set of, of archetypes? Um, but it allows us on the one hand side to now model the, the material stock of Ithaca as a city, how much of which resource is available across all of the buildings. Um, but more importantly, we're working right now on a uh, kind of decision making framework for policymakers where you can then run scenarios and say, what if I change all the buildings from this and this time bracket by changing material X with material Y? What's the embodied carbon impact of all that insulation material, for example, going into the built environment and everything else coming out of it? And what's the operational carbon savings from that step and how does that balance over time? So we talked a lot about the resource and, and the kind of activation of this resource. I want to shift a little bit and talk about uh, design moving towards the future. How can we think differently about connection details and designing? Um, and so I want to bring you back to that stack of materials that we had after the deconstruction of that house in, in College Town in Ithaca. Um, and so these are kind of examples of a studio that we then ran right afterwards, basically giving the students, this is the resource. Now, what can we do with it? Um, and um, so there were kind of really detailed analysis of what kind of size of, of members do we have where and what does that mean in terms of as a resource um, or how can we connect these elements um, in means that are you know, reversible and not, not permanent. Um, and all of this, I mean, there were many more <laughs> examples. Um, all of this then led to uh, the recent kind of installation that we did uh, just opened a month ago on the art squad in, in, uh, at Cornell University, which is called Circulating Matters. And it's essentially a, um, a kind of staircase that revolves around itself and addresses kind of the circulation circulating of matter so kind of this this word game and I'm, I'm not sure I, don't, I think I don't have to explain that in detail but um, the the idea essentially is to to use all these lessons learned and apply them to that specific material resource from uh, from that one house um, and of course it's a small part of of the materials that came out of that house um, and it's a it's an interesting location because we're talking to Ezra Cornell here, um, right directly across the, the pathway. Um, and so it's a pretty nice, uh, nice location to, to build this. Um, and what you see, if the next slide comes up, oh, yeah. is then of course the question, so how, how, what's the kind of foundation for this? What's the connection detail for this? What are the complexities of working with a non-standardized building resource? Because the biggest difference in working with uh, timber elements from a deconstructed house versus um, uh, going to a hardware store, right, is that none of these beams have the same dimensions. First of all, they're not not like the dimensions that we're using now. There's still the traditional, actually, real two by fours or two by six, which is kind of nice. Um, but then within that, you have a lot of variances. Um, and so we needed to find method design methodologies for the for the joints that allowed for all of this, right? So you only had one side that is that is defined, and the other one, you know, allows for this uh, in uncertainty, for example, of of the dimension of the member. Um, the whole thing is uh, has a, a earth screw foundation. Um, uh, here you can see the facility management of Cornell being fascinated by this uh, technique, which I'm not sure why they haven't done this before for all their temporary structures, but you know, you prove it once that it's possible and they're like, oh, maybe we should do this from now on instead of lifting these heavy stones to build our tents. So it's kind of nice to, to see these events happen. 
Um, but then here you see a little bit of the kind of detailing that goes behind this in, in terms of how do you work with, um, with uh, the, the, these uh, uncertain resources and how on the other side, then the, the textures of these, this process really become a kind of design driver in, in the development of the form. Um, and of course, in all of this process, bringing back in the documentation, the knowledge of where the specific member was when we found it, um, where it is now, how it can go back into the built environment, what kind of material quantities and qualities are attached to this. We're now doing um, in the aftermath also uh, very specific material uh, categorizations um, to figure out, you know, what's the specific strength of that type of wood, which was harvested a hundred years ago and not now. Right? And so we, we're figuring out that some of this wood is much better than what we anticipated. Um, because it is much more dense, for example, because it was cut um, at a better time, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the kind of calculation of uh, the environmental footprint of these things. Um, as a last project um, on, on this kind of design for disassembly and design for circularity uh, uh, theme, I want to show a building that we built in 2000. 18 together with Werner Sobeck in uh, Switzerland, uh, which is called the Urban Mining and Recycling Unit. Um, and it's essentially this element here, which is plugged into what is called the nest. So the building around it is, is the nest, and that's um, a, a sort of um, shelf structure, like with these cantilevering uh, concrete slabs. Some of you might know this because there's a lot of uh, research units that are being plugged into this building right now that have been published quite quite um, effectively. Um, and uh, basically, that acts as a backbone for all of these research units. And the goal is then to to be able to allow uh, research questions to be answered in full scale using that infrastructure. It's a fantastic tool that the the uh, EMPA, which is a part of ETH um, uh, in, in Zurich, um, uh, offers uh, to researchers. And so our question was, can we build in a way that all the materials that go into this building can go out of it at the highest utility and value? That was the brief for the design. Um, and so we started by thinking, okay, what are the cycles that we're using? And by now this becomes uh, repetitive, but I think it's good to repeat some of these. So of course we have a reuse cycle and right? we have a biological uh, metabolism that is much bigger than the product itself, but right? you can take a beam, you can grind it down as an aggregate to then grow something out of mushroom on it and turn it back into an insulation panel and bring it back into the um, into the, the building. And so um, just as one example, right? So that the form of the product, as long as it's biological and keeps these nutrients to, uh, as, as part of that process, right? it, is, is much bigger than the technical cycle, which is, you know, at, at their best utility and value, a PET bottle stays a PET bottle. And then it could also be PET in, in a different form, right? But it will never turn back into raw oil, right? And so you need to keep that resource as clean as possible. And so the technical cycle is smaller than the, the biological cycle. Um, this is then kind of the, the outcome. Um, the, the unit is a residential unit for PhD students of EMPA. Um, which has a kind of shared space in the middle and then on the on the extreme sides, um, private bedrooms. Um, and it is completely designed for disassembly. Um, so here you can see a, a drawing. Unfortunately, it's pixelated. I don't know how that happened. Um, but um, of kind of all the materials and the units and the levels and how to take them apart again and how to bring them back into their cycles. And on the other side, you can see an image of the um, of the assembly of the unit. All of this was pre um, prefabricated. We brought it in as seven units, which is plug and play, essentially clicked them together on the site um, to then allow for a maximum of control on both design and production. And of course, with that material cycles and uh, waste production from these um, in, in the factory. And so here you see 
the installation where this um, maybe the biggest unit, uh, this is kind of a bathroom unit that has all the kind of technical installations in it, gets put on these rails and then slid into place. And it's just anchored down with two, two uh, bolts essentially into the ground. And the benefit of this is of course, once we have to disassemble this building, which is part of, of the design process um, and, and the life cycle of this specific research unit, you loosen those balls, you slide out the unit, right? and you as as quickly off the side as you're on the side and can have full control of the disassembly process as well. Um, here you see uh, maybe two details that I want to talk a little bit more about. It's um, uh, the assembly of a mortarless uh, or mortar-free brick wall um, and the assembly of um, a bathroom uh, that is watertight and uses no chemical sealants, so no silicones, etc. Um, and so this is this wall, um, which is a kind of room divider in this unit. It's a it's a brick wall, um, and the bricks are made in a way that they have a tongue and groove system, and then can slide into um, three uh, um, kind of rebar elements, right? And the benefit is that you then at the top and the bottom of that frame, you have screws. And so you can induce enough load to make this a kind of structural unit, at least a structural enough. Right? Um, um, and um, the material itself is, uh, is called waste-based brick. It's a company from the Netherlands uh, called Stone Cycling that is producing bricks from um, um, uh, demolition waste. Um, and by combining these different waste resources um, creatively, they're creating products that then are called salami or wasabi or nougat, right? And so that is a part of the, kind of the, the marketing um, on, on these kind of circular, this is aubergine here, um, uh, circular resources. Um, the, the bathrooms or restrooms are um, um, built with as big panels as possible that coming from the installation because every connection detail is is potentially a, a leak right um, and so these are these are um, panels that come in um, prefabricated like this um, and then all of the connection details are just um, pressure sealed with dry dry gaskets um, and um, works wonderful we didn't have a single problem in the last what is it now five years that it's standing there um, and so it's it's definitely possible to build without silicones without chemical adhesives and still um, provide the kind of performance that these spaces need um, you just need to rethink all of these details slightly and these are the materials the same material that i talked about in the merit pavilion so you can see these shards right um, but similarly, the, the, um, the other uh, restroom is made with a product called Black Dapple, um, which was then titled or retitled uh, in that context as the Duben, Dubendorf um, marble, right? because it has this kind of atmosphere, although it's just a, just HDPE, so high density polyethylene, and it comes from former kitchen cutting boards, right? so it's a, a second life um, product. Um, I want to get in a couple of details um, because that claim that we had is, of course, a very academic claim to say 100% of resources that go into a building need to be coming out as a high value product. And so um, in several cases, we came to the end of what is possible with the, within the current market conditions. Um, one of these examples was uh, the faucets, because we could not find a single faucet that wasn't kind of pressure fit with three different materials and still disassemblable. All of this just, you know, is, was at least a kind of copper piping on the inside, something covering on the outside, plastic movable parts, all of it uh, connected in a way that you couldn't take it apart anymore. And so uh, in the end, we decided to print our own 3D print our own um, stainless steel faucets, which essentially allowed us, because of the new technology, to 3D print all the moving parts out of the same material. So it's a monomaterial uh, element that allows all these 
um, to, to answer all the requirements of, of uh, what a faucet would need to do. Um, a different example, uh, thinking about the kind of business model behind a unit like this is, is the carpets. The carpets are only leased and not uh, bought, right? And so um, the system behind this is that uh, the moment a company develops a fully recyclable carpet tile, the problem is when they hand it over to the customer, they lose control, right? Control in a means that um, if that customer decides to throw this tile into the dumpster, all the ingenuity that went into the development of that product and all the resource that is now baked into that product is lost because of a, a mistreatment of the resource. And so their, their approach is if we only lease this product and retain ownership, then we can take that resource back in eight years, put it back into our recycling facilities, right, and have... Uh, th there's two things that come with it. On the one hand side, you know in advance which resources come back at what time in the future. And so you have a, a little bit of a planning um, safety um, that in eight years, no matter what the market does, right, or the, or the resource um, availability does, you can bring these resources back into, into your um, production. Um, and on the other hand, the customer only pays for the service Right, so it's a, a, a small fee for the fact that you have a soft ground, soft ground to stand on, right? Um, and so all of these resources are, are uh, documented both as a kind of physical sample in the unit and online in the material data set. Um, and so we generated these, uh, these building and material passports for the, for the structure, but we did that as, a, as an afterthought. And it always bugged me, right? Because you generate this set of data um, that then evaluates, you know, which material is where, how circular is it? It also allows you then to calculate the circularity indicator for the whole building, which turned out a fantastic number, but it didn't really influence the way we thought about it or we designed it. And so in the lab now we're working on a tool which is called Rhino Circular, um, which would allow us to, or does allow us uh, to calculate the circularity of a design uh, already in early design stages. Um, and so this is a uh, set up as a Grasshopper plugin for Rhino um, and essentially tries to answer, um, I mean, an overused <laughs> slide by now, um, but the question of what is the impact of circularity decisions um, on the timeline of a product, right? If you, if you make a, a decision to build circular in the very beginning where you have a schematic design, um, the impact is the highest and the cost is the lowest for this. Whereas if you're already in the use or the finished building site, you have high cost um, to still implement these ideas. While usually a circularity indicator measurement or the metric is only applied here, right? And so we wanna use a, find a, a tool that allows us to do this much earlier um, and this is about to launch um, in a couple of weeks, um, and then it's freely available on the uh, as a, as a, on the package manager of um, of Grasshopper, um, so that everyone who wants to can can then use this in their design process. And we tried it out um, using that staircase, right? And so you can see the um, the script behind it, but then it prints a, um, a material and building passport for you on the canvas and it continuously updates this. So while you're designing, you see directly see the impact of that design decision on the circularity of the product and the building. And I couldn't um, not show this. Um, while we're talking about reuse of buildings all the, in, for the last hour, right? Um, I do want to open up that conversation and say, well, we will not fulfill the demand of the built environment only through reuse. We don't have enough, right? We're building more than we, than we have already. Um, and so it's all sustainability has to do with, with the heterogeneity of the materials that we're using. Um, and um, while reuse hopefully will cover all the technical sources, we have all this fantastic bio world to supplement this. And so here's just one slide of a installation that we did in 2000, 
1718 in Korea, um, which is called MicroTree and is a, um, a structural um, installation uh, grown out of mycelium um, that essentially carries this um, small roof structure um, and is, uh, is constructed in a way that in all of these components, you only have compression strengths, no bending or no tension. And so you're optimizing these, these uh, bricks and the, the form for what that specific material can do. It's pretty good, pretty good in compression, um, but it is really weak in tension. Um, and so it's about finding the right form, finding fine geometry uh, to then work with all these other alternative sources that we have um, access to. Um, and last slide, um, if you want to know more, um, about all of these, we have published um, quite recently. This is coming up next month um, about all the kind of recent developments. Um, and so um, there's more resources, but I'm happy to take questions and answer, answer everything that's still left out there. Thank you. Thank you so much for this for for sharing the presentation. Um, I really like that, that you show all the different that these drawing techniques, but also the uh, should I read? Okay, uh, I'm I'm very happy. To, I'm I'm very excited to see in your presentation how you're showing all the different dimensions that this project is going through, like from the design dimension, the industrial, the political, the legal, the market. And, and, and it's just amazing to see like how uh, complex is this uh, to put it to work. Um, when, I, when, I, when I saw the, the, the tool that you guys are developing for the, the rhinoceros, uh, I, I, I wonder if, it, is for example the, the the product that that tool is getting the, that this report that is saying how much you're saving how much you're um, getting from from this material is that something that uh, you foresee using to negotiate uh, or the the owner of the house or or someone to negotiate with the with authorities to 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 get I don't know discounts to get benefits to to kind of increase the the the, the production of this. Um, that that's one thing that I, I'm thinking, and the other thing, the, when you show the 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 guys demolishing, and it's like, yeah, yeah, we we're, we're we're going quickly, right? But that's another dimension, like changing that mindset of the market that we need to go really fast so we can get out of here and go to another place. But this is a completely different uh, paradigm. It's like, no, wait, slow. We need to get this down. Uh, document everything so we can reuse it. Um, really, re yeah. I, so two, two important questions. Um, and I think, I, I mean, yes, we need to completely change the mindset. And I think we need to start even earlier than, you know, with the demo crew. I mean, all of us are sort of from child age on get this, get this fascination of you know the bulldozer and it's the first like you know all we're all playing with these things that are destroying elements right and and it's it's cool and it, you know it, it has the sound effects and and so there, there has been a kind of societal fascination with with demolition right and i think that is something that needs to change um as much as um as uh, as the, the the kind of speed is money understanding on on the construction side um it but i don't think we'll ever get rid of the, of, of that part right um but what we can do is we can um figure out ways to take the timeline that a demo but uh, that a demolition um what is this a, a the timeline that a deconstruction project needs um to kind of disalign that from the traditional demo timeline. What I mean with that is that 
many of the steps that we need to do during a deconstruction can happen long before a demo permit is issued. Right, so that kind of interior salvage, taking out all the valuable uh, flooring, for example, right? all of this can happen a long time before you actually have the traditional demo start. And so with that, you already have a, a disentanglement of these two processes, which in the end um, uh, makes that the, de um, the deconstruction easier and, and um, easier to convince. Right? Um, uh, another step that many municipalities are doing now when they introduce uh, deconstruction ordinances, and we're not the first and not, not the only one, um, San Antonio, for example, just um, uh, pa passed their deconstruction ordinance three weeks ago. Um, and many of these uh, ordinances include uh, a kind of mandatory delay for demolitions. So if you get a demo permit, you have to wait 30 days to start the demolition. And that gives the deconstruction process 30 days ahead of schedule, right? And that's enough. With that, you're, you're quicker if you wanted to. And so that's a convincing argument to say, hey, if you want to start tomorrow, you have to deconstruct. Otherwise, you just have to wait a month. That's the policy, right? Um, and so there are, there are political tools that can take that argument of, of the, the time um, component out of this conversation. Um, with that, you still haven't answered the, the monetary question because it is more labor intensive and so it needs a little bit more money. Um, but also there you have now strategies that have been developed um, to, um, to uh, monetize the materials that come out of the project, right? And use that, basically pre-sell those materials to offset the difference between demo and deconstruction. Um, your first question um, is, um, is equally interesting. And I, I've never really seen that tool in, in, in the role that you described as a, as a, as a way to convince um, the client that this is a better, better, um, better strategy because the, the first um, application that we see for this tool is really uh, kind of the architecture student and the architecture practice. So we're we're seeing this need within Cornell with our own students. How do you communicate circularity? How do you make decisions? Right? What? How do you evaluate decisions? The tool will not tell you what to do, but it will maybe help you um, look at different options and variants and and weigh them uh, in in a way. Um, and so the hope is that um, that the industry will pick this up as as a way to um, to change the design process um, slightly. And with it, then of course comes the reasoning that once you have the the passport, right, you can bring that to the client um, and say, well, here's an option that is much more beneficial for you in the future, right? Because um, what we're seeing now is right now demolition is super cheap because we're not paying the societal costs that are attached with it, right? We're just paying for the labor and a little bit of tipping fees, but those tipping fees are gonna go up pretty quickly because we're running out of landfill spaces, for example. Um, and so the cost structure of demolition will change. And which means that if we start looking at the cost of a building over the whole life cycle, then a circular building becomes cheaper because you don't have these attached costs of getting rid of the house in the end as part of the budget, but you're actually retaining value and are able to sell the materials when, when they're designed for disassembly. And so the long-term perspective changes um, this financial conversation. And so some of these tools are, are meant to help in that, in that uh, argumentation. Yeah. yeah, I think that that shift in um, who pays for what um, is one is, is a critical one to shift the industry and scale this because as long as we're um, 
I mean, we had this conversation today, I think, right? But as long as the land value is so dominant in the in the cost overall cost of of a construction, um, it is very difficult to make the argument that material counts. But the more the more aspects of that material cost you bring in, um, and the more important it is, for example, what the timeline of these materials is, right? Because, I mean, it's one of the other things that right? we, we draw a plan right? and we put that plan out there as architects and we say, this is how it's going to be for eternity. But it's not true because we're drawing the chair and the first day someone moves in, they move the chair right? and the plan is outdated. Um, but it, that, that's just one example, because more importantly, the wall covering changes, you know, after five years. Um, the facade changes after 20 years, maybe the structure remains for 70 years, but the, the assembly of the plan as we draw it baked into eternity is not true, right? And so these, the, the understanding of these Stuart Brand shearing layers is, is super important in that conversation and which with it comes a kind of associated cost because in these, uh, in these uh, material passport reports, for example, you would know how much facade material is in there and that material you know, needs to re be replaced after 15 years, right? And that might still be part of the first owner while the structure maybe is then part of the responsibility of the second owner. And so you can, you can make, make the argument easier um, for, for these strategies. Uh, quite interesting how you mentioned uh, the recycling of concrete and how it's applied to uh, new structures or constructions. I just wanted to understand whether there are any other materials that are combined with the recycled concrete to make sure that the material as a combination or a consolidated material is more energy efficient or uh, eco-friendly to the environment as it's used for, since it's gonna be used for new construction. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're right. We need to look at all of these strategies holistically, right? It, it, it doesn't help us if we're building out of, only out of reclaimed or reused materials, but have no insulation and heat the environment, you know, the moment we turn the furnace on, right? So, I mean, all of this needs to be um addressed holistically um and uh when it then comes to to concrete i mean i'm personally not a big fan of new concrete <laughs> um simply because we haven't figured out yet uh, i mean there's a lot of people working on it how to get down the emissions of concrete production and or cement production and concrete curing right um, because those are the two big factors of, of, of uh, where the emissions come from. And the aggregate plays a minor role. And, and so, yes, we can replace virgin stone, whatever that is, with recycled aggregate, right? But it doesn't change anything in, in the emissions problem of traditional concrete, right? Now, we can change the cement and we can change the cement um, recipe and the cement making process right and then we have an impact but even there we're gonna run to get to a point where we can't optimize this any further and so um on the other hand there's so much concrete out there already that is structural that is uh, cast into wonderful panels right and and concrete reuse is something that isn't really yet worked on a lot there is some really interesting research for example happening in switzerland um, uh, where you go in and you cut panels or cut bricks out of existing concrete walls right and use the concrete in this new format but use it as a structural concrete right direct reuse of concrete and then you don't have that problem you don't need to do there's no cement in play right there's transportation and there's manufacturing in play um, but it's a significantly lower emit, uh, emittent than if you were to uh, recycle the concrete. And so that's, that's sort of the, the, the main argument, I think, for all materials, right? If there's a way to reuse it meaningfully, it's always going to be better than, than a recycling process. Recycling for me is, um, 
is part is is almost part of the linear economy, right? Because and it, that's why it's so easy for us, and that's why every all the companies immediately went down the recycling path, right? <laughs> Because you don't need to change the way you operate. You don't need to build a new plant. You don't, you, it's just that you just switch out one input with another, right? But you don't have to rethink your product. You still have global supply chains, right? It's one of the things in recycling that, that bulk recycling is cheaper and more efficient than doing it you know, locally, right? And so you're collecting it, you're shipping it somewhere. It's all these strategies are part of the linear economy, how we operate since many, many years in, in the global industry. Um, and, and so the, 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 the shift to reuse is dramatic because all of these understood kind of ways of operation change. Right? And that's why it's so hard right now and so complex to, to integrate these. But, but the effects are, are tremendously higher. Who makes the decisions? So do buildings designed to be less permanent or easily disassembled shorten the lifespan of the building? And also how does that affect the overall built environment? And then can this be used on a very large scale, like a city or like skyscraper scale, or is it more limited to like a house or small building type of scale? No, I mean, the ambition has to be that we do this on the city scale and with, um, with skyscrapers, if we need to build skyscrapers, that's a different question, right? But, um, uh, but yeah, that, that has to be the ambition. Um, you're right that it gets more complex uh, with height, that it gets more complex with uh, specific material systems over others. Um, but I think you brought up a, a super important point about what's the, what's the kind of timeline of a building, right? And, and we're um, in the studio that, we're, that I'm teaching right now, we're talking about the kind of shortivity instead of the kind of longevity of a, of a building. Um, but it's not necessarily um, addressed to the building assembly as a whole, but you know, the, the, um, or the kind of the, light, the service time of a building, but it is addressed to the time that one specific assembly stays in place. Right? And so if you build for disassembly, the benefit is that you can change, right? You have a more flexible building. You can easily move interior walls. You can even easily expand or contract the building. And so we actually have a more sustainable strategy also in terms of retrofitting it, in terms of adapting it to new societal needs um, and all the things that we're try right now trying to somehow bring into a building plan by designing for flexibility, right? That's sort of built in the idea of uh, design for, I mean, the AIA calls it design for adaptability, concada design for disassembly. The, the ideas are the same. Um, and a, a third benefit in this is that you also can maintain a building better, right? It's much easier to say, well, I mean, I don't know, the light switch broke, right? And, but it's not the switch, it's somewhere in the cable. And it means in a traditional way, you now have to pour out, like pull out the whole cable, rip open the whole wall, change the plaster, et cetera, et cetera. If you're able to use a paneling system, you just go into the cable, change that one piece and put it back together. The, the damage that this one change um, has environmentally, right, is much smaller. And so actually the hope is that the service time of a building gets longer because of that, right? Because you don't need to tear down the building because one column failed, you could exchange it, right? But the, the the assembly of these buildings will change much more often or the, do you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. Uh, my question is kind of related to the previous question. So with this idea of designing buildings to be disassembled, I'm wondering how you think it will affect sort of the precious nature of architecture. So some architecture is seen as like a masterpiece or something that should be maintained over time and kept in this sort of state. Um, do you imagine that when design, if we start designing buildings to be disassembled, will all buildings be sort of seen as temporary or um, maybe we'll move away from that idea of 
sort of this masterpiece of architecture? No, because if you look at it from a historic perspective, the fact that we're not building for disassembly is an idea that's maybe 60, 70 years old. Before that, all buildings were built for disassembly. And look out, I mean, we, we still, we're, we're still looking at the Roman uh, aqueduct, right? I mean, that thing is built for disassembly if you wanted to, right? Because, because in this perspective, the cement is weaker than the stone. You can easily claim the stone. But with the switch of changing from it, the mortar system in a brick wall or in a stone wall from a lime-based mortar to a cement-based mortar in whenever that happened, the 60s, um, you suddenly have the connection that is stronger than the stone. And if you try to access the stone, you break the stone before you break the mortar. Right? And so th these are small changes, but they are so significant at, at the large scale when you assemble them all together that, that, um, uh, that now buildings are simply not disassemblable. Right? But it's something that happened in the last decades. Right? And so if you look at it on a longer scale, we're still, we're still looking at these buildings from the past as examples, right? And so why should that change in the future? At least that would be my hope. There was one here. I was wondering if there was a like plan or system in place to catalog and library these materials that you're collecting to be used in that broader scale. You know, like you take apart one house and you're left with all of these things, but what if those have to go to four different other buildings? Like, how do you think, like, are there going to be plans in place to like keep those in a centralized location and like keep track of like where those are and, and like how big they are and their like scale. Yeah, I think that's crucial. Um, as long as we're m looking at this on a building scale, we're not gonna be successful, right? You need to look at this at an urban scale. Um, and the material and building passport is sort of the tool that is being developed right now. This is not us, this is a uh, global community of researchers that is working on these ideas. Um, and there are first countries in the European Union that are now mandating a material passport as part of the building permit process, right? And so um, in the Netherlands, for example, you now need to submit uh, your building passport in the Mad in Madaster, which is their uh, system, right? That stands for material cadaster. Um, and, and that starts to create that database that you're, that you're asking for. Unfortunately, that only works from now to the future, and it doesn't do any good yet for all the buildings that have been built already, which is where we're trying to come in with the scanning tool right, to generate this data set um, for, for the past buildings. And so then overall, you could say, I know that in half a year, this building is going to be demolished or deconstructed um, and I know what's in it right because I, I have either a material passport from the permit process or I have a scan and so you could then start designing with these resources half a year in advance and that's enough time to say I maybe ask for a building permit using these materials and ideally could then take them from the deconstruction side just in time to the construction side of the new building because one of the big questions in this matching of demand and supply is uh, the, the cost of storage. Right? So if we're taking down buildings and we're all stacking them up in reuse centers, that those are inner city, uh, like large scale infrastructures right? that cost simply money every day. And so the better we can match this, um, the cheaper the whole system gets, but it means that you need to do this way ahead in time because it takes time to design something as we all know. Um, it also takes time to permit something. And so if you want to have the construction, the new construction site and the deconstruction site happen at the same time, you need to start way ahead. Right? And for that, we need these databases as one example. All right, uh, incredible. Uh Felix Heisel, thank you so much for, for sharing that fascinating and, and important work for the state. We very, very much appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you.